Hi, this next video will cover the Rococo and neoclassical periods and also cover ideas related to the Enlightenment and art and also satire of the aristocracy. So we start off with this Rococo style which was extremely luxurious and associated with the top 1% of French culture. Um, so those in the aristocracy, those associated with the king, it was particularly associated with the mistress of Louis the 15th, not Louis the 14th, Louis the 15th, uh, and her name was the Marquis de Pompadour. So she was really a great proponent of this style and had paintings of herself created in this style. So it's a luxurious artistic expression of salon culture. Salon culture means people are gathering together in luxurious spaces. Um, in Paris, people are returning to the capital city. Um, this culminates in the style known as Rococo, coming from the French word for stone or pebble and also for shell. So very decorative, very um, kind of frilly, and it's kind of taking that Baroque style to the next level. It appears in paintings and sculptures, but also in interiors. Um, it's associated, it's considered a more feminine style, so you see it in small, delicate, decorative interiors. You see it um, in small, decorative arts as well and then in architecture. So let's look at an example of a Rococo painting. Um, starting off we have one by Francois Boucher who was one of the key figures in the Rococo art movement. Um, just looking at this painting you can get a sense that these were in intended to be incorporated into interiors, interiors designed in that Rococo style. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times the subject has to do with love. So love is the key theme in a lot of these images. And they're pretty straightforward to understand. They're not overly intellectual. They're not overly complicated. Um, it relates to kind of that luxurious and playful lifestyle that a lot of these aristocrats were leading because the monarchy had become an absolute monarchy. A lot of these nobles didn't have a lot to to do so it reflects that kind of playful lifestyle. Uh, so looking here we can see it's called Cupid a captive so this idea of trying to disarm Cupid trying to remove some of his power um, in order to keep him from fall getting people to fall in love so you see Cupid here reclining uh, they're basically tying him up but not in a scary way they're tying him up with uh, ropes covered in flowers and you see him surrounded by three very lovely women um, and they're also removing his arrows so that again he can't shoot people and shoot people with the arrows to make them fall in love it's in a beautiful garden setting, this idea that the kind of garden you might encounter in a villa or a palace owned by one of these French aristocrats. So it's somewhat similar if we go back to that Bronzino image of the exposure of lust, the one with Cupid and Venus where you see um, her disarming Cupid, but that one was so complicated, that one was very intellectual and was owned uh, by the French king. It was intended for the French king, uh, Francois Premier, but this is a very much more straightforward, much more friendly kind of image. Um, the Probably the most famous Rococo image is the work by Fragonard, The Swing, and you can see that you have a woman here who's swinging and you see a man who's pushing her here. So again, a scene of leisure in one of these beautiful gardens that you might encounter in a really upper class household. Um, but you see that she is having a secret meeting with like her secret lover or her boyfriend. And so you see him hiding out in the bushes here and as she's being pushed on the swing, she's becoming more and more visible to him. She's kicking up her skirt and so that means that he get, actually gets to look up her skirt. Um, she's kicking her shoe to him. And the man who is her chaperone or escort here, who's trying to keep her out of trouble, um, clearly has no idea what's going on. What's nice is you have these little sculptures who help you understand the narrative. You know that the little putti there, little uh, angel figure is going, shh, don't tell anyone what's going on. So again, very overgrown and fertile and lush, uh, but speaking to ideas of love and fertility, um, but also just speaking to the kind of environments that people might have been familiar with and that are pleasing to the eye, pleasing visually. So this is a very happy, pleasing kind of subject matter, but it's important to keep in mind that in about 20 years, the revolution will get going. This is the kind of lifestyle that most French people are not living and that they're going to start objecting to. So what we start to see is more of a satire of the aristocracy, um, especially in England. So we see an artist named William Hogarth who develops prints and also a series of paintings that 
satirize the aristocracy, the lifestyle that they lead. So here we see a work called Breakfast Scene from Marriage a la Mode, which Marriage a la Mode in this case means stylish marriage. And he's poking fun at the kind of marriages that aristocrats, or those in that high level, um, what they tended to, to have. So this was actually an arranged marriage. These are newlyweds. They're in their very grand house. But you can see the house is a mess. There are chairs knocked over. Um, the woman has actually hosted a party the night before. You can see the servant is exhausted. The candle has just been blown out and it's burned all the way down. Uh, they've been playing cards. You can see those on the ground here. Um, the man, however, has been out on the town. So he is just now returning. He's clearly exhausted. He's not sitting up straight. He's reclining and looks like a mess. Uh, and you can see the dog is actually sniffing at him, sniffing at a bonnet in his pocket, indicating that he's been out kind of canoodling with another woman, indicating the marriage is already falling apart. Um, and again, she's been hosting her own party, so they're already leading these very separate lives. Um, and then we see the butler here, or the man who kind of runs their household, who clearly has brought them a stack of bills that they need to tend to, and neither of them want to deal with it. So you can see that the man's kind of going, I give up, and he's running off to the side. Uh, and so you can see that although this is a very grand house and although these people are very nicely dressed, the whole thing is kind of a mess. Um, also commenting on the ancestry of this family who have a bust of one of their ancestors and he has kind of a pig nose speaking to the fact that the ancestry doesn't matter, it's kind of silly. Also you see there's a curtain covering an image here and this would have been a reclining nude female and these would have been covered most of the time and then when you maybe have friends over who were interested in seeing it, um, maybe your guy friends, you would open it up or you would remove the curtain so that you could see what's underneath. This was part of a whole series, so there were other scenes where eventually both of them end up dying, speaking to the fact that this was such a horrible marriage. Um, also, also at this time you have the Enlightenment, which directly links up to the revolutionary period, this idea that people have more knowledge, they feel um, more open to the ideas of democracy, the idea of divine right goes away, this idea that um, God has given the ruler power. People stop believing that and think, oh, the people gives the ruler power. Um, so in this case, you start seeing more scientific ideas being incorporated into art. We've seen previously um, ideas of the anatomy being studied, but even more in this case, we're seeing more knowledge, ideas of knowledge and science. Um, ending up in art. So more rational thought, moving away from religion, um, beginnings of industrialization. We have important individuals like Isaac Newton uh, around this time. So one of the works that's often seen as connected to these ideas of uh, the Enlightenment and this period uh, is the work of Joseph Wright of Derby, who was an English painter. And so we see a philosopher giving a lecture at the Ori. And you can see that this was created in the 18th century. And you have a philosopher here. And then you see a variety of people listening. And it's done very much in a Caravaggesque style, right? So you have the tenebrism. You have um, the dark shadows and the bright light. But in this case, it's not a divine light. It's not the light of Christ or the light of God. In this case, it's more the light of knowledge. Um, literally, in this case, at the Ori, there's a lamp in the middle that represents the sun, and so they're studying the movements in the solar system. That's what he's giving a lecture about. But um, if you think more symbolically, it's more uh, in a case of knowledge spreading, and that's what the light can represent. So I think this is a great image showing that transition to the Enlightenment as we're moving away from uh, religion as being a central focus in art and moving more towards interest in knowledge. I also think it's interesting there's all these books in the background, this idea that more and more people are becoming literate and more and more people are starting to collect books. They're becoming a little bit cheaper with more uh, printing technology developing. Okay, so next we have this neoclassical style. Neo means new, and so we're returning to an interest in classical style. That is the style of ancient Greece and Rome. And I know you're probably thinking, didn't we just do this in the Renaissance? Um, but yet again, they're returning to an interest in the, in the classical period, um, but it's a little bit different this time. So you have the discovery of Herculaneum in Pompeii. Um, they are starting to do more and more archaeology in these areas, although it's not very scientifically done. Um, and a renewed interest in some of the subject matter that especially relates to republics and ideas of democracy and the importance of the state. So that's very key. Um, one of these artists is actually a female artist. We see the work of Angelica Kaufman, uh, and her work is very 
sweet. It relates to women here, so that, that was probably deemed appropriate for a female artist, um, but also has a very nice neoclassical kind of subject, this idea of family and an important moral message. That was really key. So this is called Cornelia presenting her children as her treasures. And so you see a woman here presenting the jewels that she owns. Uh, so she's showing off all of her jewelry as her most important possessions. However, Cornelia is showing off her three children, saying, you know, you may have these material objects, but I have these children and they're my most important possessions. And these children will actually go on to do great things for the city of Rome and of course Rome and the study of Rome was really important for the development of this neoclassical style so it's a very sweet image in terms of a woman's most valuable possessions are her children um, but the theme and the moral message fits really well in what some of the goals were for neoclassical painting you can see that the lines are very strict very crisp and clean uh, the interiors are not overly done we're moving really far away from that Rococo style. Um, and this is what neoclassical artists will favor. It's a really different interpretation of uh, the antique or the classical period than what we saw in the Renaissance. And so that's a key idea as well. And the artists are really looking to Poussin for most of their inspiration as the style is developing. All right, so the most important work from the neoclassical period, or one of the most, is The Oath of the Horatii by Jacques-Louis David, who has important roles uh, before the revolution, during the revolution, uh, during the time of Napoleon, so he is very important throughout uh, this period of French painting. And so in 1784, this work was actually done for the king, and it becomes really a symbol of a lot of the ideals of the revolution. So you have these three Horatii brothers who are going to fight three other individuals from another family, um, the Curatii the, in Alba. And so they've actually like nominated three against three so that the whole cities don't have to go to war. And so these brothers are going to do it. They're taking the oath, this idea of city over all, all else, the idea of city over family. Um, because in particular, one would know, because this was a well known story at the time that one of the sisters was married to one of the Curatii. So knowing that they were going to have to go kill basically their brother-in-law um, if they were to win. And so these brothers will go off and do that. They actually are victorious. One brother returns. The sister ends up being very sad because she's lost her husband. And so he kills his own sister. So this idea that all sacrifices must be made in order to um, achieve what's necessary for the state. So this is the three brothers, the Horatii, this is their father, they're taking the oath, and then these are the women. There's some clear gender differentiation here, just in terms of color, but also in line. The men are really strictly defined, very tall and straight. The women are very curved over. Um, you also have this definition of the arches over here, dividing the composition into three parts. You have that very austere neoclassical interior, the door simple column um, and a really nice perspective scheme and this was really a blockbuster of a painting people waited in line to see it people really wanted to see this work so it was became very very famous uh, not only in in France but also in Italy okay so just a few notes about the revolution um, this Age of Revolution is a 40-year period from 1775 to 1815. It's a huge period of social and political upheaval. So you have the American Revolution, and then you have the French Revolution. Um, eventually, Napoleon actually comes in as well, um, kind of filling the power vacuum in France after the chaos of the revolution. Um, the reign of Louis XIV begins in 1774, and then you have the American War of Independence, you have the abolition of feudalism in France, you have the abolition of the nobility, then you start using this guillotine, which is a quick way to start killing some of these nobles, um, and you eventually have both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette executed. So that's a big change, obviously. Um, so this reveals kind of how bloody the system had become at that time. We have the death of Marat, and Marat was an important figure in the revolution. He actually was killed by a woman who was loyal to the crown. Her name was Charlotte Corday, and so he would take these long baths for his skin diseases, and so we can see him here. Uh, he was in his bath doing his work, and this is a work dedicated to his death by killed that, she was, that he was killed by this woman. So it's by David, and he's saying this is to Marat from David in year two, um, because they restarted basically the calendar after the revolution. 
and he looks very much like a Christ-like figure. Um, the neoclassical style was also picked up in America, and we can see it with George Washington here, standing in contrapposto pose. Um, he's wearing his everyday clothes, so we're seeing him not as a man of war here, because he only took up war when absolutely necessary, and he didn't want to wear a toga or anything that made him look too classical. He wanted to look like an everyday figure, and that's where, we're, where we will end.